So before we begin, I'm just going to go and ask everybody to introduce themselves and if they're bored of GLC as you go around the room. So can I start with our oh, last member here? Uh, Francine Gannon, GLC, uh, Center for Studies of Poetry. Hi, Francine Gannon, GLC, Jam Roy, uh, Greenway Board. <coughs> Chris Manfredi, Greenway Board. Deborah Sperio, General Leadership Council. Chris Benjamin, Greenway Board. Tony Pollock, Boston Parks, and the Mobile Leadership Council. Maggie Hunt, Greenway Board. Bob Ward, Greenway Board. Colin Schlichter, Greenway Board. Nancy Blennon, Director. And I'm George Murray, also on the board. Um, we. We are going to do several things tonight. It's a pretty packed agenda. Um, we're going to be discussing and the board will be approving um, the FY13 budget. Um, we'll then be going on to the five-year plan um, that we've been working on for months. And we will be presenting some of the findings of that plan with the hope that we will be able to deliver a full plan with, with more input from you and from others um, to Secretary Davey by July 31st. Um, and then we'll be updating you on some of the Greenway things that are happening, and then we'll open up for general discussion. Uh, so if I could ask somebody if they would like to uh, move that we approve the minutes. Second. All in favor? Aye. Any thoughts? Thank you. Um, now we'd like to report on FY12 and fiscal year 13 budget. Um, they are numbers that you've seen a great deal of. Many of you have been here at many public meetings, so they won't be particularly new. Um, but we do now have the FY13 budget, and we will be um, discussing it, and then um, moving for approval if the board decides. Thanks. Nancy? <coughs> I will work the machine for you. Uh, so three things particularly we want to cover here, the annual statement of results for the prior fiscal year, fiscal year 12, the um, statement of goals for fiscal year 13, and um, the, the FY13 budget. Um, so uh, first off, this is the slide that about a year ago we presented of the goals looking forward from that point for the year. Um, and then the, the, the one addition here is on the right our, our kind of assessment of um, progress against those goals. And so uh, the, the more filled in the circle is, um, the more complete uh, action against the goal was. And so on beauty in terms of uh, color and more plant material and uh, our new seasonal planters um, and progress on our organic horticulture, um, Good progress made there. We'll have some details on all this in the few slides to come. Um, on vibrancy, the Greenway Open Market was a success, and um, we are in the process of fabricating the new custom carousel. Um, Mary Sue and Armenian Heritage Open, um, uh, and other things. We did have another public survey. We uh, launched the art planning process. All of this, having run through a whole bunch of words on the slide there quickly, just worth saying, um, this presentation, like so many other things, uh, is posted on our website. Um, it, or rather, it will be posted on our website uh, tomorrow. Um, we, this is a slide I think that, that is familiar, we've shown it a couple of times, but uh, uh, emphasis on transparency and uh, easy to find documents in case you weren't able to come to tonight's meeting. Next. Um, so this is the more specifics on the, the statement of results for FY13. Um, and here are all the words we thought it actually would be more interesting to see these things in pictures. So first of all, um, at uh, Dewey Square, um, we redid the, the garden bed there. Um, almost 1,500 new plants, a um, raised bed with edibles, a rain garden, um, a pollinator garden, and uh, we actually just, um, in the past week, made our first donation of um, vegetables, um, of edibles, to um, uh, Loving Spoonfuls, um, the nonprofit that uh, does hunger work. We also began in the um, 
in the demonstration composting area, we've started pickups with the Clover food truck of their pre-consumer waste. So that's being used. So all of this is intended to sort of demonstrate what you can do in the backyard. Next. Um, on parcel 15, that's where the rings fountain is. Um, a major bed renovation with a nationally recognized uh, port designer, um, Pat Kalina from the High Line, who spoke at our annual meeting last October, did the design here. This is a design that focuses on um, ease of maintenance, but also great four season interest, color, textures. Um, it's fabulous. Go up, enjoy the rings fountain, enjoy the garden. Next. Um, Occupy Boston. Uh, after uh, there they are in the top in the top left in the bottom left after the the judge's ruling, and then very quickly within a week the park uh, uh, was was looking great again. Okay. 11,000, uh, 11, Excuse me. Um, more bulbs planted. Um, particularly in the lower left hand are alliums. Those are um, starting to become a real feature on the Greenway. Um, and we got a lot of great public input um, and a lot of uh, great feedback. We have a whole bunch of pictures of those posted on our Facebook page. If you want to check them out. Next. Um, we've been doing organic care um, of the horticulture since the Greenway started. Um, we are uh, Boston's only organically maintained park, one of the only uh, organically maintained parks in the country. But we would always get a lot of questions when an application was going down. So one of the things that we focused on this year was trying to communicate that better. Better signage on the, the vehicles where the sprayer is, better signage to get to look at the ground when an application is happening, um, better messaging. As you'll see, there's a web link, um, rfkgc.org slash organics, for all sorts of information about our green practices. And um, we did over 200 events in calendar 2011, free events for the public, concerts, yoga, farmers markets, um, and that should be close to 300 for this year. Uh, and the Greenway Open Market, which we piloted last summer, was so successful that we've expanded it to a full season this year. Um, it is going very well this year as well. Many more artisans and we've introduced other types. Next. Uh, the rental carousel um, neared 100,000 riders last year and uh, continues to be really popular and successful and fun. Um, and as mentioned before, we're, uh, we look forward to next summer um, the, uh, the custom carousel rolling out to be even more fun. The Green Room Mobile Eats program um, drew compliments and attention from chefs and others. Um, lots of crowds at uh, Dewey every day for lunch, not just for the farmer's market, um, but for food trucks as well. <coughs> and programs, we did all these programs, but a lot of it was really in partnership with uh, great nonprofit organizations. Um, Chinatown Main Streets, North Bennett Street School, the De Cordova, uh, major institutions that are looking to partner and bring great things to the Great Way. Um, The art planning process that we launched um, had terrific feedback and really great engagement from the public. I think we had perhaps our two best uh, attended community meetings ever um, on the topic. Uh, and um, we will, at the annual meeting in October, um, make this uh, the announcement of the, the process and, and plans going forward a uh, centerpiece. Um, in calendar 2011, um, we expanded our volunteer program and are expanding it further this year. 1,100 uh, hours from volunteers, a lot of really happy, um, uh, happy help. Um, we actually ask all of our volunteers to, um, when they're done, we ask them to visit a website and, and give us feedback. Um, I believe it's greatnonprofits.org. And so there's, there's a lot of really positive comments there, which we're, which we're happy to see. And then our, our third graduating class from Green and Grow, and um, our first hire um, of a Green and Grow graduate onto the Conservancy staff. Um, and so from, from looking backwards at all of those wonderful things to looking forward, um, we, the, the first bullet there is about a um, temporary mural that's going to go up, Nancy will talk a bit more about that um, in her update. Um, 
more plants, um, 18,000 bulbs going in, including the alliums that I pointed out, um, will be expanded to uh, plantings in the north end as well. Um, mentioned the 300 free events, including, um, you may have seen the mayor came down to the Greenway uh, earlier this summer to announce the Boston Local Food Festival, um, which has been so popular and so well attended um, that it's gotten too crowded on uh, the other side of the river and uh, is now going to be on the Greenway this year. Um, Greenway Open Market, Mobile Eats, um, the return of last year's popular $2 Tuesdays at the Carousel. Um, our planning process, which I mentioned, and the um, launch of a membership program for the Greenway. We've done a number of uh, focus groups over the past number of months. Um, and so really trying to craft that to engage people in um, uh, supporting the Greenway. New custom carousel under fabrication will be selecting an operator. The um, uh, and mentioned as well the, the increased opportunities for volunteers and ways to engage and make the Greenway a place that we can all come together. So from there, the, uh, the from results and goals to the proposed budget. Um, this is the expense side, um, operating expenses only, not capital expenses, and it looks pretty similar um, to the budget for last year. And so, I mean, at, at the highest level, 73% of the spending is, is programmatic. Um, that is sort of a classic ratio that people look at to assess um, uh, an overall budget. That's, that's quite a good ratio. Um, the FY12 is an, is an estimate. Um, we will go over full numbers with our audit in, um, uh, at our annual meeting in October. From there to the operating revenue side, um, it again looks pretty similar. It's down slightly. Um, the what's worth noting is in both FY12 and in FY13, um, <coughs> state's contribution is level funded. Apologies, that bottom number there is a little difficult to read. That's um, mascot cash support of 1.84. A little hard to pick up there. Um, uh, level funding there. Um, the use of the top two items on both of those, um, the use of reserve funds, um, which occurred in FY12 and is planned for again in FY13 as a, as a strategic investment in ensuring that the Greenway maintain, is maintained at um, the level that we've all come to expect. That is not sustainable beyond this fiscal year. These reserves um, built up during good times will be exhausted at the end of um, fiscal year 13. This translates those numbers into sort of what's notable. And mostly what you'll see there in the words is no change, no change, no change. Um, no planned changes in staffing across various departments. Um, minimal change for the, the Green Road program or the approach for events. Um, so it looks, it looks pretty similar. I think the intent is to hold questions for the end. I believe that's the last slide. But um, I did want to ask Steve Anderson, Steve Anderson, um, to talk about the work ink contract. As mentioned um, here, it's certainly one of our notable expenditures. It is um, up at the, at the end of fiscal year 12. It's up for um, renewal. And so, Steve, do you want to sure. stand up? Sure. Um, as you may remember, in May of 2010, we entered into a one-year, the board voted a one-year uh, services, basic services contract for working. Within that contract was the option for two additional terms. Uh, the term we're asking for now would be the last of those terms. Uh, there would be a full re-procurement, competitive re-procurement for fiscal 14. Um, the agreement is basically the same in all the costs, terms, and conditions as the previous years, except for about $10,000 more than previous years. Um, that's due to direct costs, about $4,000 for additional trash, uh, which it, I think is a good thing. Uh, more people are in the parks. Uh, the food program may be you know, contributing, but more people are out there, and it's been um, doubling our trash collection and disposal. There's also $6,000 additional dollars for a weekend seasonal person for working to have in the parks because there have been a lot more people in the parks on the weekends and they were overwhelmed, so they requested that. 
Um, there's also a no-cost addition of our pilot recycling program. We believe that that should be a no-cost addition and that trash will decrease um, as recycling increases. Um, the total value for this contract is $520,396.18. And we'd ask for your vote on that. So I'd like to open it up um, to questions, comments, um, advice from the board or the leadership council. I asked a, a question about your organic program. How much in savings by composting on site do you think, in terms of tonnage, do you think you see? Because you know, as we all move into the composting of our green materials, it's a huge savings to us. So I'm curious if you can measure Yes. Sure. Um, it's worth actually clarifying, I think, the, the composting that I was referring to in, in picking up uh, <coughs> pre-consumer waste from Clover is a, is a demonstration on site. Um, it's extremely limited in, in the um, amount of material. Um, all of our organics are composted, but we don't, absent a, a maintenance facility or a place to do that, um, that composting is actually we collect it, it is taken off site and brought back. Um, I do think that there would be um, you know, some, real, some real savings there. I mean, we're, it's the right thing to do. Um, and so right now we are closing the loop on that, but um, because it's only sort of a, a small portion that's done on site, I don't think we're achieving all, all the, the cost savings. If the work came to contract with the Department of Energy, would you fill the void that they leave? Ah, um, well, I think that it's the, the answers to these two things are related a little bit, and, and after I give a short answer, let me defer to Steve. But in the absence of a maintenance facility, um, we don't actually have the we don't have the infrastructure that is part of what working that supplies, and so that would be a very difficult uh, question to answer. I think um, it's why in the current state, um, outsourcing and the basic. The mobile of snow is you know, the only option. But Steve, do you want to offer? Sure. I mean, you know, work ink is roughly one quarter of our operating budget for operations and maintenance. But um, you know, trash collection is basically done by them. They mow our grass, um, supervised by the work staff, um, and I think most importantly, they provide a presence in the park from 7 a.m. to 11 p.m. seven days a week, holidays you know, just all the time, my staff wouldn't be able to pick up on that. Somebody has to do it. With, without them, um, you know, we, we would have some other options as far as we But so, uh, just to add on to that, so they're also providing, I mean, in essence, they're providing an off-site. They provide equipment and other things because we don't have a place to keep them. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. And, and in coping, this year they built a brand new facility in Dorchester that's, uh, it's huge. It's just a, it's a great asset for us. An example, they also do our snow removal as an additional cost, but all of that equipment has to be stored. We have no place to put any of this. Um, with, without that, um, without a maintenance facility, without working some storage facilities, we'd be, um, have to go out and purchase something, some space, some place to put all this stuff. Plus, we'd have to, we'd have to purchase the equipment, so it'd be a capital future. So how satisfied? We've been very satisfied. I mean, it, it's it's a very good relationship. Um, I think that the people at Working uh, really care about this contract. It's one of their very few um, competitively bid contracts, and um, they work hard at it. Um, I'm, I'm not sure. I'm, all I ever hear from people in the parks is how much they enjoy the people from Working out there and appreciate our using them. So. I've never heard of that before. So, I any other, any other questions? Well, we have, we have to, by approving the budget, we will both approve the extension and approve the budget. Um, or we could take a separate vote. All in favor of the work, is there any more discussion on working? Um, all in favor of approving the working contract? Um, um, any board member opposed? Um, and now we need to move on to the overall budget. Um, and 
Bob, I don't know if you want to say anything. You're the chair of the finance committee. I, I think it's uh, very clear. Um, and it seems to be reasonable. We we'll spent a lot of time on it. So anyone who's not on the finance committee have any questions that on um, that, that that this raises? It's, it's as you can see, it's fairly steady state from from this year. We all understand the numbers for this year, and it's really very little change um, for FY15. Any further discussion? All in favor? Uh, any opposed? Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you, Jessica. And we have the entire staff. Okay, and so now we're going to move on to the um, to the overview of the five-year business plan. And let me just set the table a bit here. Um, as I think you all know, um, we've been asked by Secretary Davey to do a five-year plan. Um, we have been in that process literally for the last six months, um, and we it, it has been quite a process. Um, we are now almost at the end of the process, but we're not at the end of even the beginning of this process. Of delivering a plan to Secretary Davey on January 31st. What we're doing today is doing what we've done with many of our constituencies, which is to advise you where we are now, ask for your feedback, um, incorporate that feedback into the plan that we will give to Secretary Davey by July 31st. Um, and we also want to make clear that it's been very clear to us from the process that what we deliver to Secretary Davey um, at the end of the month will be really the, the first start of the discussion. Um, the real start, the research in place, with the board having said, this is the direction we think we can go in. Um, but there are so many important players in this process. Um, Secretary Davey has asked us to find other sources of income. And we've done a lot of research on that. But we need to iterate through with those possible revenue sources before we can actually say, this is definitely the plan. So what we will deliver on July 31st is a plan that we'll discuss tonight, <coughs> that we'll probably refine over the next couple of days, and that we hope will frame the discussion over the next several months um, so that all the parties can agree, yes, this is the five-year plan for the Greenway, with the understanding that every five-year plan is just that, a plan. And it needs to be revisited every couple of years. And that would be part of the plan. Um, the Greenway is only three years old. Um, we, we are three. Um, you know, in three years, we'll be double our age now. Um, and so it's only prudent to take a look at it again midway through the five-year plan. So um, the purpose of today um, is to gather more public input. Um, we want to give you a preview. We want to summarize the efforts um, that we've gone through to seek more public um, input for our priorities. We want to sum give you a summary of the funding assessment um, that was done by an outside group. And we want to do the framework of the five-year plan with revenues and expenses. Hey, Don. Come on. I don't know if you have to get Don't mind sitting <coughs> under the, whatever you want. I don't want to disturb you. Go ahead. Just That's okay. Just oh. for That's Donna Friend from the Free Sorry, everybody. Um, and, and we want to give you the conditions, um, you know, of, of where we're going and, and what we're doing. Um, so the Greenway Business Plan, um, you the next slide, Jesse, thank you. Um, the charge, Secretary Davey directed the Conservancy to create a business plan to identify adequate resources, which we spent most of our time on, to maintain and program a world-class park. Um, assuming an annual decrease in state support to zero state support in FY18. That was, that was our goal. Um, what we did <coughs> to do that was a lot of research. Um, we did the fundraising assessment the Technical Development Corporation, what you'll often hear to us refer that, that as TDC, um, did for us. We did an executive salary survey that Secretary Davey asked us to do. Hi, Mike. If you don't mind, here, uh, Nancy and I will be sitting, standing most of the time, so feel free to take one of these turns. Very nice rainbows outside. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's a good start. Yeah. Very It's all for us. Um, so it's all for us. It's Mike Cantalupa, um, the chair of the GLC and member of our board. Um, 
the executive salary survey done by the Collins Group and the summary of public input, input um, done by Howard Stein, Hudson Associates. So Nancy's going to take you through some of this, um, then I'll be back later, and um, we're going to discuss this in, in, in the slide presentation. We'll ask for board and GLC input, and then we'll open it up for general discussion. Thanks. Thank you. First of all, it's wonderful to see so many people who care about these parks here tonight. Thank you very much for taking time out on a Tuesday night to join us. Uh, let me begin by talking about the research uh, framework. What we felt was really important is that there would be an independent firm doing research and providing an independent perspective on these important questions. And let me tell you a little bit about the firms. TDC is uh, a Boston-based company that has been uh, in business for over 40 years here, providing the nonprofit sector with business and management skills critical to their missions. They've worked for uh, the Peabody Essex Museum, the, uh, the Boston Foundation, Arnold Arboretum, the Massachusetts Cultural Council, the United Way, the Boston Foundation. So they have uh, deep skill and knowledge of the sector and of, uh, please, Ed, I'm sorry. No, no, uh, wonderful to have Ed Lambert of DCR join us, a member of the Leadership Council. No worries, we just have to. And uh, their work is really on both sides of the aisle, if you will, on uh, best practices for nonprofits and for funders who provide uh, support for nonprofits. The Edward J. Collins Junior Center for Public Management in the McCormick Graduate School of uh, Policy and Global Studies at the University of Massachusetts, Boston. Uh, it did our compensation work, uh, very good of them to do so, recommended by Secretary Davey. The Mass, Mass DOT has used them in the past, I believe. And Howard Stein Hudson has done our uh, public intercept work. The uh, HSH uh, is a transportation consulting company that uh, provides a variety of services, including public involvement services, Public and non uh, public and private clients. Next, please. So the first thing, now that we are uh, a crack and three years old, uh, we wanted to do is to ask as many people as we could in a four-week period whether their vision of what the Greenway should be might have changed, and as importantly, kind of how are we doing? and fulfilling the promise of the Greenway. And as you'll see in that four week period, uh, there were uh, some interesting things to us about where people came from who were surveyed. 62% uh, is wonderful, but it was surprising to us that there were as many as 40% from outside the Greenway area, 22% from Metro Boston, and 16% at the very beginning of our tourist season. And this is what the public told us uh, when we asked them, uh, do you think that the Greenway should be first class? Oh, I'm sorry, we have, uh, I think it's a different computer. If we asked them, do you still feel the Greenway should be first class? Do you feel it should be operated with the highest standards? Do you feel it should be enlivened as a public space? And do you believe it should receive periodic enhancements? You'll see that their answers were between 86% and 95% positive that yes, it should. And then the conservancy that's been asked by the state to deliver on that promise, we see that they believe that we're doing a good job and more should be coming. And so we use this kind of measure to ask the public, and now we're asking you, on how we should think about our priorities over the next five years. And it's important to us that we think we have a vote from the public to keep going with the highest possible Clinton. maintenance. Clinton. Don't, don't need to drive your Clinton, come on up. 
Yeah, we're just moving. Try and get some more chairs. Okay, great. <laughs> yeah. the, uh, it's the highest possible environment in the city for park visitors and to continue to look for appropriate places on the Greenway for enlivening, free, exciting, interesting activities uh, for them to enjoy besides the gardens. Next, please. The research findings done by uh, TDC really started in one place, and it was to look at best practices among five local and national peer parks. When we talk about peer parks, we're talking about signature urban parks that have been designed in the last 20 years. We have a combination of great horticulture, dazzling features like fountains, public art, uh, food, and a variety of things that really work together for beauty and connection. And we, uh, we were very fortunate to receive the complete support in interviews by entering into this interview process with us and TDC by the Friends of the Public Garden, uh, Post Office Square, the Esplanade Association, the Friends of the High Line in New York City, and Millennium Park in Chicago. What we uh, believe our charges from the secretary is to look for ideas where if the state has to dramatically reduce its support to the Greenway, which it, uh, it owns, because the Department of Transportation is in, uh, under such budgetary stress, which we've all read about in the paper, really not able to even uh, do repair and replacement of key infrastructure as a highway department. It's a very, very serious situation. And the secretary has asked us to use all our best efforts to see if we could get to no state funding, uh, all private funding by the end of FY18. So the first place to do it in independent research was to look for best practices. And what we found is there are two barriers to assuming that private money will replace state funds. One, as in looking at the best practices model of our local organizations, we have in the, can we go back one? In uh, the public garden and in the Esplanade, we have two wonderful parks that are directly supported. Maintenance and horticulture on a daily basis are, are su excuse me, supplied by the owners. And those owners in the public garden, they are the city of Boston and in the Esplanade by DCR. Where uh, the donors come to play a very important role in both those places is to supplement the uh, work that is done by the owners to add value, to add greater horticulture, to assist with the care of sculpture when it comes to what we're talking about the public garden, to support in other ways that add value on top of the baseline maintenance and horticulture. Post Office Square is a really unique example. I think uh, it they would not mind my saying that uh, if I had a garage underneath the Greenway, we'd be all set. <laughs> <laughs> the Post Office Square is a for-profit, uh, and it takes care of the park as part of its mission with the proceeds of the parking revenue. It's just a unique situation, but what they do for us is they are a peer park. They're a signature urban park with uh, extraordinary infrastructure over and above the basics that also offers things of interest as well as uh, great maintenance of the infrastructure of the parkland itself. Then when you're talking about the Friends of the High Line, the Friends of the High Line is just as old as the Greenway Conservancy. Uh, it opened in 2009. And the High Line it was uh, largely constructed uh, with a significant, significant amount of money by the city of New York, supplemented by uh, a capital campaign of 
about $50 million from uh, donors in New York. But operations is a different thing. Uh, the city struck a deal with the friends of the High Line, and the city does not support them at all. And they are doing the very best they can to come up with a combination of private revenue sources, including uh, some very interesting and aggressive uh, earned income ideas to, uh, to work on their park. The park is smaller than ours, but every bit is complicated. And uh, you know we're both young, and we'll see we'll see how uh, the High Line does. Millennium is a, a different example again. In Millennium, uh, the city of Chicago pays most uh, pays for or does most of the daily maintenance in uh, Millennium Park. Millennium Park Inc. retains the responsibility of the Lurie Gardens, which is about a fourth of Millennium uh, Park uh, overall. And for that, they raise funds and have an endowment to maintain uh, uh, the Lurie Gardens. So I think with that short synopsis of these five, you'll see that across the, the framework known as public-private partnerships, Every, every uh, park responds to its independent ecosystem uh, for funding. And even with, within a single city, different parks can be funded in a variety of ways. And that's certainly here uh, true of Boston. We, uh, so we went on to talk to DDC, excuse me, went on to talk to constituents, those funders who were uh, responsible for uh, supporting the Greenway as philanthropic donors in the past, and prospective big participants. For those of you who are new to our meetings, a business improvement district, a bid, a Greenway bid for park operations, would be the first in, uh, in the Commonwealth, but not the first in the nation. And uh, the idea there is that abutting property owners uh, voluntarily uh, agree to an additional tax assessment that comes in to support the Greenway. And we'll come back to that. We've been in conversations with abutting property owners for almost two years now. And TDC, uh, as an independent voice, asked them again how they might feel about replacing uh, state dollars. And, and can we go on to the next slide? Thank you. Oops, sorry. Back up. Thank you. So what they told us is that <coughs> there is upside potential for more philanthropic support and for bid support, but it was it is conditioned on some very important things that must be in place before state funding can go down. For charitable contributions, the evidence suggests that a reduction or removal from uh, of funding from the state is likely to trigger a decline in philanthropic support. And potential bid participants have been clear all along that a bid formation is contingent about continued state funding. The reason for that really is the perspective of these two groups is that the state is the owner of the land, that the Greenway shouldn't be the first of the state's parks to receive no funding. And if the state would stay at a reasonable level, uh, roughly equal to basic maintenance, that they see that as a more equitable formula. If that's the case, that we can't replace the state's funds entirely with contributions or bid funding. What's our next alternative? Our next alternative would be uh, to grow earned income. So we asked the people who were willing to be interviewed about a variety of earned income ideas. And again, there is potential additive uh, revenue uh, with earned income, but it's sensitive and it's tricky. For those people who responded, the uh, Conservancy can increase revenue through income sources, particularly smaller scale ones, 
ones that we've been doing all along, um, food trucks and our new carousel, all those things were seen as very favorable. Larger scale needs, larger scale initiatives, particularly those that might approach an edge of commercialism, need to be seen, I think, with a much longer time frame to meet with the public, to balance taste and access with the need for dependable revenue. Can working with the public and the city and the state, can we find that appropriate balance? We believe so, but we also know it's going to take time and a lot of public dialogue. So the, then we come to the last one, which is endowment. I think everyone knows that the Conservancy has a $14.5 million endowment now, and the question was, could we replace state dollars with endowment? That's, that's possible in the future, and we believe that looking at, again, other cohorts that are similar to a nonprofit like the Greenway, there are two <coughs> conditions that must be in place first. One is to grow our donor base from its current roughly 3,500 donors to a larger, uh, probably a, a, a group that has been with us longer. Again, we're so young. And often endowment is best raised when it's packaged with a capital improvement. And those are downstream somewhat, I think we can all say. So this, there is no silver bullet, is what this has told us from TVC. But additive, we believe we can get closer to the Secretary's request and be on a trend leading up to more non-governmental re revenue. Next, please. So we believe, in looking at these findings, uh, that the assessment clearly tells us that state support within the five-year period of this business plan, FY14 to FY18, simply cannot go to zero because there are no funding mechanisms individually or in aggregate that would come to the table to replace it because the opinion is that the most equitable solution is for all the stakeholders to be some part of the funding puzzle. We also know uh, that uh, we must solve this together. Uh, the way some of us talk about this in the nonprofit world is no money, no mission. And uh, we are uh, going to be very, very challenged to uh, face our current responsibilities and our current level of care, our current level of public programming until we solve this. So we got busy and started to solve it uh, with uh, this idea that the puzzle is additive. More contributions, bid funds, and more earned income. So let us now talk you through some of the details. Okay. Um, so, it all comes down to numbers, um, and what the, the, the conclusions that Nancy just came to you are the ones that we want to keep in your head, that this, over the next five years, the state funding cannot go to zero and, and have us support with bid funds and the contributions, but they can possibly decrease if certain conditions are in play. Um, so the first bar chart you see is FY13. Um, you'll see that there are three sources of income in FY13, the budget we just approved. Um, the blue is the state, a 2.1 level funding for um, since FY12. The, cap, the charitable contributions um, called RKGC, um, in, in this, if you're reading over in the right hand side, are the charitable contributions that we think we can um, gain in FY13. And the red is the amount of reserves that will be exhausted um, by the beginning of FY14. So that red goes away in this five-year plan. So the five-year plan starts FY14. We're just giving you FY13 to show you where we are as of today. Um, so what you'll see is, is that, as again, this is iterative. So 
we, we know the state needs to decrease its funding. Um, we know that the bid, the possible bid contributors are against them taking over what they see as state responsibility. And so what they wanted to do was to say if the state funding goes down, then the bid funding goes down. Um, we can't really do that even mechanically with the bid because the bid is set for five years the way the legislation works. So what we're working on with the possible bid participants is the idea that their funding remains level, but that the that more and more of their funding goes into a capital reserve, which I'll get to on the expenses. So the, the bid funding remains um, constant at the 1.9, which is the estimate. Um, so in FY14, 1.9 from the state, 1.9 from the capital contributions, so for the conservancy, adding it through, it through our income and through our contributions, and 1.9 from the bid. So it's that three-legged stool that we've been talking so much about. And I, I keep saying we need, in the last week or so, we need a new image. Um, the three-legged stool needs to change. Um, we need to grow another leg, but it, it's not going to grow really quickly, so the stool thing just doesn't work. But we'll, we'll come up with our open suggestions on, on the image that we should have in your mind. Um, so you'll see in FY15, um, we start saying that we are going to have to have more revenues or earned income, new income, which is the light green in the, um, the conservancy new. And what that is, um, is a combination of um, various new ways to get income. Um, it's earned income that perhaps will need some changes in guidelines um, so that we could have um, naming rights um, and part of the Greenway that it could be, and we need some public process around that to see what people could could think of was was the right thing to do, what was tasteful, what what could happen. Um, possibly it's it's sponsorships by some corporations for some events. Um, possibly it's a skating rink in Duty Square. Um, along the lines of Bryant Park, um, which has been hugely successful in getting earned income from their skating and from their, from their um, little shops around. So that's all things that will take time. Um, the reason why it grows, um, and it's much bigger out in the later years, is that it just takes time. Um, it takes time for us to build up our philanthropy, which we show building up, and it takes time for us to have the idea of new earned income, to test the idea with the public and our constituents, and then to make it happen. Um, the, the new bid in the sort of goldy kind of yellow um, on the top is not that current bid participants would be paying more. It's that we expect that over a five-year period there will be new buildings built along the Greenway and that we hope they will participate in the bid. Um, so by the end of the five years, by fiscal year 18, according to this plan, the state is less than 20% of our overall budget. George, you might want to comment on why there's such a big jump in this year to those other years, because it, it is a big jump. And we're now beginning to address appreciation. And that's perfectly into our next slide, Mr. Gordon. Thank you very much. Um, oh, no. <coughs> the next slide. Sorry. I, I thought we were having the next slide, but we're not. So I would just answer that as, as it is. Um, what, what we basically have said is that the difference between the 4.5 and the 5.8 um, is 800,000 in capital reserves. You've heard us talk about that. If you've heard us. Okay, that would be fabulous. Thank you. Um, this really is hot off the press, so this isn't very well rehearsed at this point. Um, but so 4.5 is our budget in FY13. Um, it goes to 5.8 in FY14. Um, many of you have heard us say that um, if we base ourselves on comparable parks, um, high impact urban parks around the country, we should be at 6 million this year and above. But we understand the world that we're living in, and so we think we can do a budget for 5.8. But that is mostly, the increase in that budget is mostly due to capital reserves. Um, we, we need to start putting away money. Um, 
We're only three years old operating, but some of our fountains are five years old. Um, they're coming up on their useful life. Um, they, they need to be not totally replaced in any one given year. We need to be thoughtful. We need to be able to replace what needs to be replaced in any given year. And we don't have that capital reserve right now. So we need to do that. Um, you'll see it building up over the, um, the next several years. Um, we hope that, that for when the state decreases in dollars, the reserves will build up and the bid will be able to um, make sure that those reserves are used in a way that they think appropriate. Um, so we, we, those reserves are based on a multi-page study of, a, of an inventory of everything we have in the parks, from fountains to trees to, to lampposts. Um, giving them a useful life and working back what we need to put away each year in order to replace them um, in, a, in a fiduciary responsible way. Um, the, other, the other increases, you'll see um, some increases. It's mostly um, the, the programmatic work that we know will need to have some inflation increases over time. Um, we, need, we know that maintenance costs will go up as time goes on. Things will wear out that aren't capital replacement, but that are that are need to be repaired. Um, we know that pro programs will. We, we do a lot with the little in programming that we have because we partner with so many people. But we know that will need to grow. Um, we love our Green and Grow program um, that takes our apprentices from the city and and helps them to understand um, maintenance and horticulture through understanding the park. Um, so we see very gradual increases in planning and development. No increase. Sorry, Linda. Um, we have, um, we have um, development increasing very little. And when you think about how much administration and development is going to play a role in growing all those other sources of income, I ask you to think about that in terms of how little we're growing that as we go forward into the future. So this is this plan from an expense point of view is 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 as as, as tight as we think we can get it. Um, but it does try to address in a responsible way keeping the park in excellent condition. So now maybe you can get me back on track. Um, okay, so the conditions for non-governmental um, revenue. What do we mean by that? Um, there are just conditions in order for us to be able to get earned revenue. Um, we need to have the momentum really explode. We need to take the next several months to really have the discussion with the state, with the public, with the bid folks, and say, yes, let's all buy into this plan and go for it. Because success breeds success. And we have been very successful <coughs> in raising money for a three-year-old park but we need to get back that momentum. Um, we need a nonprofit leadership that's focused on fundraising. Um, we have great with that now, um, looking around the board, and it really is just fabulous. We need to keep that in place. And we need the bid. Um, it is absolutely necessary to leverage other contributions. Um, as I said to some bid folks I was talking to last week, this is hardly a great negotiating position to be in, but we definitely need the bid. Um, we, we, there is no other source of income that can be as strong as the bid, as quick as the bid can be. And we have people who sit at companies that are, we're talking to about the bid who have uh, buildings in other cities that have bids. And their experience has been very good. Um, the people who've been involved with Bryant Park have seen over a 15 to 20 year period the bid numbers stay constant and the growth come in earned income. So they are believers that the bid can be the spark to really create a lot happening in the park and a lot of excellence in the park. Um, we need conditions for more earned income. Um, there are, we've said this before, there are, there, are, there are earned income possibilities that aren't possibilities right now. We need some changes in guidelines. We need some changes in the way people are going to think about naming rights. We need some things, changes in the way people are going to think about having events on the Greenway. Right now, we can't have our gala on the Greenway. Um, so there is no ability to, to section off the Greenway for even a night. Um, we need to think about that. We need to think how important that is to us um, in terms of what's important for all the public to enjoy the Greenway 
almost all of the time? And how do we want to balance that public access versus having enough earned income to allow the state to decrease their funding? Oh, so there's, I won't drag you through that again. Um, so we'll, we'll come back to this, but the, um, the other thing that is part of this study is um, the executive compensation. Um, several months ago, um, the Secretary Davey asked us to hire the Collins Center. Um, the study is not totally complete yet, but they have been able to give us some slides. And their findings are that for both our, our wonderful two leadership folks, um, Nancy Brennan and Jesse Brackenberry, um, they are right in the middle of executive compensation. We went out and we studied, or they studied, the Collins Center studied nonprofits, um, and they studied government, and they tried to find some quasis that were on target with what we do. Um, and um, we are the red, everybody else is blue. I, I don't know how much you can see that, but in both cases, both for our numero uno and our numero duo, um, we are um, right in the middle. Um, and that's where uh, the Conservancy Board thought we were. Um, it has been confirmed. Um, I want to go public and say that that is not because we think they are middle of the road executives. Um, <laughs> we think they are fabulous. Um, and we think they're, they're clearly worth more. Um, but um, they've agreed to come for the salary and we're very grateful for that. Um, and we think that the by the time the compensation study is complete, which will be the end of this week, there will be lots of backup to that um, to show the detail of who, what those positions are, what their job description is, and, and how they're compensated. Uh, so, run a little off, Jesse. So, really, what we're saying is, who are the beneficiaries of this park? Um, it's Boston. It's Greater Boston. It's the Commonwealth. Um, they're they're clean. They're green. They're, they're a wonderful amenity. They, they, they attract people to adjacent properties. We just got word that eBay is going into, is moving from Cambridge into International Place. Um, and I don't think that that's um, you know, an accident, um, that they're coming into the Greenway. And I don't think the fact that the Greenway is there is an accident of why eBay chose to come. Um, young professionals want uh, the, the best companies who want to locate in Boston and relocate in Boston um, want to attract the best young professionals, and they want uh, an 18-hour district. They don't want the sidewalk to, to fold up at the end of the night. And it's a, it's a place of pride for us. It adds cachet to the city, um, and it increases revenues with both um, property taxes and hotel and sales taxes. Um, most of those go to the state. The property taxes go to the city. Um, and the, the beneficiaries really are the Massachusetts economy. It brings in tourists. Um, we see that in the park, and we hear about it. It's getting tweeted. It's getting um, more and more known that the Greenway is a place to come if you're a tourist. Um, hotels are happy to be here. I don't see any of our, our hotel general managers here tonight. Um, but they will tell you that it, it so helps with them being full in what might be a slower season. Um, and it, it adds um, tourism, and which adds jobs and that tax revenue to the Commonwealth. So we're just going to remind you a bit of what it used to be like, um, uh, just in case we've all forgotten. Um, most of us haven't, but it is, it is amazing to remember just a few short years ago what that was like. Um, and then a picture of, of a, a sort of now, I don't think that's absolutely current, but a sort of now. Um, and oh, what a difference, and uh, what a difference a park makes. Um, and so we're, um, we're proud of that park. We, we think it needs to um, stay in this public-private partnership to let it grow, to let it double in age from three to six over the next three years, and uh, to really make sure that we continue to be da -da -da, um, the, uh, the, a great place for this public-private partnership. So a few things I want to leave you with. Um, it's an aggressive plan. Um, we thought about doing a conservative plan, a um, middle plan, and an aggressive plan. That's kind of the way those of us in business are used to thinking when we think about five-year plans. The problem was, was that the aggressive plan is the only one where we were able to show um, a reduced dependence on state funding. So we're going with aggressive. Um, 
The Conservancy reserves that have cushioned our operations for the last several years because Nancy and others were smart enough to put away funds um, before the crash um, in 2008 to be able to make sure we had some reserves going forward. Those, will, those rainy day funds, um, it's been raining for the last several years um, at the Conservancy, and they're, they're, they're extended by FY14. Um, we, we want to, to just sort of have everybody know that we believe that to end the public-private funding model in the next five years is very high risk. Um, declining park conditions would threaten capacity to generate the other revenues. It risks philanthropy, um, because philanthropy has told us they will not pay for regular park maintenance and operations. Um, they're unlikely to want to pay for the enhancements if the regular isn't being done well. Um, the bid possible participants have been very clear that the discussions go, no, go nowhere if the state totally um, goes away. And um, the conditions to get earned income are really not possible if we don't have a good um, partnership with the state. Um, so the deteriorating conditions would risk everything. It would risk economic development. Um, there would be need for capital infusion later. Um, you know, we can see downtown crossing. Think about what downtown crossing could be like if they'd done the bid 10 years earlier. Um, if, they had, if they had had that many sources of income into downtown crossing. Um, we all read that there's millions of dollars having to go into downtown crossing from the city now um, because it did deteriorate. We don't want to be there. We want to be able to, um, to keep this going and not have a need for capital inclusions in later years. And we want to remind ourselves and everyone that we are the roof deck of the tunnel. Um, you know, if those fountains go, Steve doesn't do his uh, wonderful work in keeping them going, um, if, if there are permeations in that roof deck, um, the tunnel's in jeopardy. Um, th there is a reason why the Department of Transportation is, owns, that owns the greenway and owns the tunnel. It needs to be kept really safe and really um, safe for the, the, the uh, cars underneath. So, we think the public-private partnership is the way to go. We just want to leave you with this happy note that um, the Globe has called us the most unconditionally happy spot in all of Boston. Um, and in the dark days when we're trying to figure out how we really are going to keep all this together, we, we keep this image in our minds. Um, and I know you've all been there on wonderful days where the kids are all running through, and it's, uh, it's always wonderful to see. So I've just given a lot of information. Um, some of it was confirming information we, we thought we knew. Um, some of it is expanding that information by having um, CDC do such great interviews um, with so many of our constituents. Um, but it's been a lot. So I open it up to questions and comments from the board. And yeah, Georgia, just something that uh, I want everybody to be really clear fiscal year 14 is in 12 months. Oh, thank you. I mean, it's, thank you. And when we're looking at a timeline that's already short, it's, it's not even you know, 18 months. Short enough. We're talking about 12 months, or sort of 11. We're at 11. <laughs> um, so uh, yeah, we're on a July-June fiscal year. So thank you. Um, more from the GLC and the board. Well, it risen to set like a broken record for those of you who've been here before. Uh, this is a, an incredibly complex piece of property. Uh, the tunnel itself, so those of you who are here, know exactly how complex that is, and, and uh, that, is, and then this is the, on top of it, and. Uh, I've said it before, but if you get a chance to take a tour and see the complexity of the facilities because of where we are. The Rings Mountain, for example, uh, is an amazingly complex uh, piece of engineering. Uh, were we starting fresh today and designing all this, um, we certainly wouldn't have something as complex as that. We would try and get something that was nice, but that is a wonderful thing that we are out there on a day like today. But the infrastructure underneath is, is really frustrating, but it takes it takes time and effort to, to keep up. I think I just want to just be explicitly clear that if there is really zero based funding and no funding coming from the state, the likelihood of bid participation would be real and skeptical. And therefore, who then would the burden fall upon of maintaining this greenway? Would the state then be able to have to come up and take care of this? or how 
would it there be any, you know, uh, future funding and protection in keeping the Greenway as we see it today? Um, that's a really good question that I don't exactly know the answer to. I mean, the, if, the, if the Conservancy can't pull off the bid and the philanthropy, then we would have to turn the park back to the state. Which it is no a state park, which, which has no money. money. So it's, it, it, it is the right question, but there's sort of no answer. Um, it, it's, it's a question of, um, we think that the public-private partnership is the solution. Um, we think that the public partnership side of it has to be more than just owning the land. We think it has to be financial contribution. And we think that not because we think the state is flush with money, not because um, we wouldn't have loved to come up with a better solution, um, but because um, the, the other legs of the store, or whatever we're going to get, is, is contingent upon some level of state funding. And the dialogue is going, over the next several months, is going to be what level is what? You know, what, you know everything is an absolute of 1.9 million. You know, things can go up, some people can go down. It, it, it's going to be a matter of degree. Um, but we would have loved to have been able to deliver to the Secretary of Plan that said zero state funding by the end of FY18. And um, the you have to believe, if you're going to commission the research, you have to believe you know, you have to have, they have some credibility in the findings. And the findings were that that's just not possible. Just to elaborate on that, because I worry about this in terms of financing up to the other board. But what we have is an overlay here of a concept called the conservancy. And that means that the quality of care at one end of the country is the same as it is in the middle. And so the chat allows us to have consistent experience, it allows you to have our feel that this is one place. And without that, uh, and, and the programs that go from one end to the other. So if that concept goes away, uh, then you can go for it. Um, so, yes, Suzanne. Is there any state park that has no funding, that is privately funded at this time? I mean, why would the state assume that the Conservancy could take on that burden? Um, I think they were hoping, and we can't we can't blame them for hoping. Um, you know, I think that they were looking at um, competing resources and competing uses of their dollars, and they were saying, you know, let's see if we can let's see if you can do this without us. Um, it's a it's a good question. Um, you know, let's see if we can do it without state funding. As I said, we would have loved to have done it, but we don't. Think that. But there is no other. Park. There is no other that I know of. No. There are there are parks um, that have been unstaffed for the last several years because of the public climate state funding. There are other parks that are supported uh, uh, through a variety of sources, not unlike uh, have been identified here, through partnerships uh, that are supported. And, and, and if I venture to say, well, there might not be parks, there might be state facilities that in partnership with another group that has the ability to generate revenue, unlike our state agency does, uh, do have that, but certainly nothing on this scale. Uh, we would be talking about uh, 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 something that would be very hard to compare. Uh, there's certainly nothing uh, uh, as complex as this particular piece of property. While we have some iconic state parks, you know, the, the valid point is made that there are some complexities to this, mechanically and otherwise. Uh, but Having said that, its location and the real estate around it also gives it some advantages that other state parks don't have as well. So the comparisons are pretty difficult. So, and just so I'm clear, and I forgot, I got to you. I'm so sorry, sorry. here we've got Matt here. Um, just so I'm clear, so there are state parks that have had to be um, closed or are unstaffed. So people can come into them, but there's, there's nobody taking care of it. Uh, no, that's correct. Okay, but there's, but there's no state parks that somebody else totally takes care of and the state does nothing? Not, not in the sense of a state park, but we do have properties within the state park division okay. uh, that might be managed by a municipality. Okay. Uh, and so the municipality that might get benefit uh, uh, manages it. So there are some uh, small handfuls of examples like that. Uh, the uses are, are, tend to be uh, uh, more benign than they are here. Uh, so 
I don't want to offer those and say, well, you know, you know it's, okay. uh, so, so I guess the there, there's different kinds of parks uh, for uses uh, that uh, probably in, in very different categories than this particular use. We didn't find any in the country when we when we looked for um, you know parks that were public parks. Um, that then didn't have any public funding. The High Line was the exception because they were they were made by private money totally. They, they were never a public park to start. Maybe um, just to add to that, um, Bryant Park is an example of one that is owned by the city of New York. Um, but over a 16-year period, that both paid bid and earned income has essentially replaced any need for city funding. And I want to say, during the paragraph, I made a mistake. Uh, Jesse, who is from New York, um, made sure that I <laughs> got it right. <laughs> and the High Line, let me come back to the High Line. The High Line is actually supported up to 30% by the city of New York at this point, and their um, non-city revenue is 70%. That's where they are today. I thought that. I believe everything you said, so I'll remember that. Oh, yes, Clinton. Hey, and thank you, Georgia, for the presentation. And thank you, Carol, and Jesse, and everybody else who worked on it. Um, I, I'm Clinton Bench from Mass from uh, Deputy Director of Planning. And um, we're very excited about the progress that's clearly been made terms of looking at potential uh, for substantial reductions to state funding uh, over the course of the next five years. Um, just a couple of points of context, and I appreciate the question about uh, parks that don't receive state funding. Um, Mastock's intent, um, certainly um, as the owner of the facility, has never been to walk away from the Greenway. Um, the Secretary's original request always assumed a certain level of continuing support, especially in, in terms of in-kind uh, support. Um, we're glad to, I know this isn't the best building in the world, but we're glad to <laughs> house the conservancy here in this building. There, I guess there are worse places to be. Um, you know, certainly there's always the intent to, uh, to the extent practical our, our district sets up the highway division. Uh, being able to provide a certain level of uh, maintenance. Um, glad to be able to help provide the um, uh, utilities, um, and, uh, including water and power, um, through cooperative arrangements with our highway division, um, District 6 again. Um, and also, I, mean, I think it's important to, to recognize the contribution of the, the former Turnpike Authority, which has now been subscribed into the, into the Department of Transportation in terms of the construction of the park, as well as um, as Todd's and Turnpike Authority's initial substantial contributions to uh, uh, the uh, Conservancy's finances and development uh, and such. So I just want to be very clear that there's there's absolutely no intention of, of mass uh, walking away from this facility. And our, our preference all along and continues to be um, to see a very healthy, Conservancy operating this park. Um, there's, we certainly have plenty of headaches um, elsewhere throughout the uh, transportation system. Uh, we don't need to be figuring out any kind of new administrative structure or uh, maintenance uh, structure for uh, maintaining uh, the Greenway. So, so let me be very clear again. Our, our, our intent and goals, I think, are very consistent. Um, with the rest of the members of, of the, the Conservancy Board. And uh, with that, I think that what we've, what we've seen here today, um, again, is a, a great step forward. And I guess if I had any you know, sort of initial comments, um, uh, seeing a lot of this information um, uh, for the first time, is that uh, I think as we prepare um, to present to the Secretary a uh, final report, um, that details a lot of what are, what's seen on these slides, um, assuming there will be a full written report. Um, I think the place that he will likely be looking for greater detail is really in the, the revenue side, um, looking for additional detail, um, ex 
weeks on exactly what the development plan um, is going to be over the course of the next five years, um, what specifically um, our staff um, expecting or, or uh, recommending that we can expect from very specific pieces um, of the philanthropy puzzle, um, what specifically um, is reasonable to expect from some of the individual earned income concepts that have been presented. I'm very pleased to see some of those creative concepts identified. Um, but we'd like to, we, I think we're going to want to be able to see you know, just how much can we reasonably expect from these different pieces. Um, and I think with all of that, there's been a recognition that we can feel altogether solid um, on what exactly a step down plan can be. Uh, and what exactly we feel very strongly we can expect from those specific philanthropy and energy income sources, I think we will then be in a place where you know, the process can begin to play itself out. And, um, I know, Georgia, you and I have had conversations in the past about this having to really be an iterative process. Nobody knows exactly what the future holds. And, uh, certainly, we understand that there are going to be iterations um, should the finance plan end up being acceptable to the second year. Um, but again, I think where we need to start is a very solid footing. Um, this clearly presents that, that we're a long way towards it. Um, but those are just sort of my you know, observations uh, from seeing the, uh, seeing the presentation uh, today. Um, Thank you, George. Any other report? Yeah. Well, uh, and, and I would say that what, what you say is great, and it's, it's good to hear all the support. And I, I think about Bryant Park. I, I grew up uh, going into New York, and boy, you, you wouldn't go anywhere near Bryant Park it, for any reason. Uh, and to see the transformation that has happened in Bryant Park and, and the real estate that has gone up around it, I think we can all kind of look at that as something that it took 16 years, probably 10 years, really. So, you know, I think that. And there's reason to be hopeful that the five years from now we'll be almost three times as old as we are right now. <laughs> and, uh, so that we, we might you know, get to a point where we never were prime part. But. No, we don't want to get to. I mean, there, there, there are all sorts of examples. I mean, most of us remember when, when Central Park was not someplace that you wanted to go, certainly at night, and sometimes not even during the day. And you know, it's been 35 years since they started their conservancy, and, and you know that their it builds up. Um, so we, we do. I'm really happy to hear you say that, Clinton, um, that um, that you think we're heading in the right direction because um, we really do need all the parties, the public and the private, to work together to make this happen. So that's very encouraging for us. Thank you. Um, anyone else? And I'll open it up to discussion for everyone else. Uh, the, uh, okay, let's open it up for questions. Yeah. Laura, would you? Uh, oh, we'd like to read, we'd like to capture some of your ideas and comments, and uh, Laura is going to describe. Thank you. <laughs> okay, um, a little movement here. One, one small point, George. Sure. I'm sorry, um, at the risk of speaking too much, but the board and the GLC have spent untold hours, to say nothing of the staff, working, working, working on this five-year plan. And I can only imagine if all that time and energy was put on fundraising and philanthropy, <laughs> that you know, I think it's time for us to, to start doing more of that and, and, and less of the other. Here, here. Okay. Tom Powers uh, from Boston Harbor Island Alliance, and we do, we are a proud partner of the Conservancy. Um, we do a lot of the same things, sort of raise money, sort of earned income, sort of wrestle the same things. And I guess I just have two thoughts. One is just come in, you guys, enormously. I have to say, the first time I saw Secretary Davies better politely, but I just thought that's a fantasy because we know how hard it is to get private donors and the way public-private partnerships work in the private sector is they've got to believe the public sector is doing their share or they just walk away. And we, I see that. I am in touch with a lot of the uh, executive directors on the country of similar friends groups from national parks. 
and we hear that all the time, that the public sector is walking away and the private sector feels like, hey, we pay taxes, that's what, what we expect. Um, I do think you've treated this exactly right, which is to consider Secretary Davies' letter not as a literal thing, but as a challenge, and say, all right, how close can we get, how well can we do? And I think uh, the plan really re really reflects the amount of time that you guys have put in. The one question I would have that I wondered if it's overly ambitious or you have better information than I do about the bid is, it seems to me if the bid is looking, the folks who would have to pay it in, uh, under the bid are looking for equal kind of uh, matching the percentage that, uh, you know, how do bid folks feel if the percentage from the state goes down to 18% in the fifth year? And have you, I assume you guys have, have wrestled with that. Um, their contribution stays the same, but at least as a percentage matter, it's not being matched. And is that going to be a core of the problem? Um, good question. Um, I don't. <clears throat> Uh, an iterative process. Um, we last talked to the bid folks um, a week ago. Things change. Um, but what what the what the direction we're heading is that the bid is being um, proposed to be used for three things: enhanced maintenance of horticulture, some some limited amount of programming, and public arts work. And the third, the major component of the bid is for this capital reserve. And that's the place that is very defined. You know, it will be a separate reserve. The big board will control that. Um, we will go to them for, you know, things that need to be replaced or things that we want to do preventive maintenance so that it doesn't need to be replaced. And they will have some control of that. Um, I'm not saying that we have that ironclad from them, that that would be acceptable. But that solution, if it is a solution, came out of discussions with several of the big possible big participants. So we're not sure if that works. Um, uh, we, the bid is five years. And so what will happen during the first five years, if we're fortunate enough to have a bid, is that that's, I think, the, the, the sort of outline of it. When we get to the end of five years, um, the bid will have the choice to read up or go away. And I think a lot of that will be iterative discussions with the state, with the conservancy, and figure it out from there. But I think um, the, the, you know, we, we need to move to the bid. We've been talking about this a very long time. So I hope that we can get to a place where um, we can have discussions among the state, the bid, and the conservancy and say, does this really work? Um, and we've had some real leadership um, with the bid um, with, with some of the, the big real estate owners in town. Um, and we're very hopeful. We're, we're not there. We're not there at all, but we're very hopeful. Yes, if, if I could just respond real quick, and I, I think you want to hear what everybody else has to say as well. Um, the, I, I want to reiterate a couple things. One, regarding the Secretary's original letter. Um, I do want to make sure that, um, and, and I've mentioned this to members of the board, but I, I know it's a number of members members of the public for today. Um, the Secretary's letter was meant to be taken literally. The Secretary's letter was not meant to be a challenge. The Secretary's letter um, was quite clear in saying that it is our goal and has done to reach a point where there is zero direct support coming from MassDOT towards the Greenland Conservancy and maintenance of the park. That is still the intent. That still remains his position and he expects to see a finance plan that incorporates that. As I said, however, there is substantial opportunity, I think, here for us to find a place where we can continue to maintain our commitment um, to preserving this facility. There is, there is a certain level of commitment that we must have towards the capital asset that we built and ensuring that indeed the tunnel <laughs> doesn't end up getting ripped up or something to that effect. Um, so, with, there's certainly an intention, a continued intention for the state to be able to provide any kind of support in the way, but I do want to also um, challenge um, members of the public, the big community, the business community, um, to really consider all of the possible creative means towards getting to the Secretary's goal, because this is uncharted This is a very unique facility that does not necessarily have a comparable anywhere in the country, regardless of how much we talk about Bryant Park or the Highline or any other facility. 
It's simply a new territory, and frankly, we are in new political territory as well over the course of the last five years. I understand the point about saying that folks pay taxes and expect a certain um, return from those taxes, but quite frankly, it's been made very clear by our constituents over the course of the last five years that there is not an appetite for increased taxes and increased revenue for transportation. We continue to find ourselves, even though we have reduced the number of structurally deficient bridges, and I can set as an example, I think it's really illustrative, getting from 500 down to under 400 across the state, but we still have over 400, and there is not a clear sense among our constituents that there is a willingness to provide additional revenue through taxes to make sure our bridges are safe for our customers to use throughout the state. And that is a very new context. It's a context that was made clear by the governor's proposal a couple of years ago to provide additional revenue to transportation through a gas tax increase, and there was not the appetite for it. So again, I just want to make sure that we are all challenged to understand that we are operating in a very, very new situation. And we're excited about trying to find a way to make this successful, but we have to think way outside the box. And I think we have. Yeah. And I want to also be clear that we um, we had a research plan. We confirmed that with you and the secretary. We did the research. It was done by an outside group. And the board, as we currently are thinking about it, cannot responsibly propose a plan that brings the state down to zero at the end of that way. We would love to. It would have been great. But we can't do it without the bid, and we can't do it without the company. And both those groups are very clear that the state needs to stay at the table. So we can, we can think through how the state stays at the table. We can think through what that really means. Um, but it is absolutely clear that it is a public-private partnership, and that requires public input in terms of revenue to the Greenway. Okay. Just Thank you. Vivian. So my name is Vivian Lee, and uh, I'm the president of the Boston Harbor Association. And I want to second uh, many of the things that Tom Powers talked about in terms of the progress that's made. This Greenway is just spectacular. I mean, we take people, members of the press, on tours. I did one yesterday for someone from San Francisco, and they just cannot believe. You know, they, they hear about the big dig, and then they see the hot, the roadway underneath our city then they see the greenway on top. And I think that you know, uh, people are just, you know, it just takes their breath away. So I commend what you have done and what your staff has done. Um, and I also think great progress on the report. So I say that as the head of TBHA. Now I want to speak as a private citizen who lives in Boston and has lived here for more than 30 years. Uh, I attended a series of the public hearings that I hadn't talked about earlier this year when Secretary Davey, he personally attended, I don't know how many dozen of those public hearings on the fair increases and service, service cuts and such, can well understand why he is concerned about this. I mean, he was, you know, every single hearing, it wasn't one like this where there were only 50 people, there were talking about 500 people at just about every hearing that was held on fair increases and the service cuts. And the pressure that was put on Mass DOT was extraordinary. And frankly, the legislature has not stepped up to the plate. So everything that Clinton said is absolutely correct. And we can understand that. We understand that this administration, the Patrick Murray administration, has two and a half years to go. The governor has indicated he is not running again. He is trying to set up a situation so that the next governor will be able to handle these issues, which is why we're talking about a five-year plan. So frankly, this administration will not be here in five years to frankly continue this conversation with you. But they are doing what is responsible, which is that they are trying to set up a, a mechanism so that the next administration, which will be actually negotiating and having these discussions with you in five years, will at least have the framework. And I, and I commend the administration for doing that. I serve on the Boston Conservation Commission. Any development that does on the waterfront comes before us. Commissioner Lambert is here. When his staff comes and talks to us about what they need to do on a park, an island, or whatever, there's a certain tone and there's a culture. And they understand all the things that you're talking about about the parks. And in fact, they come very well prepared and they answer and they, they present and, and such. They talk about how the 
entertaining and the staff and such. And today, in fact, we brought 100 people out to Spectacle Island, members of the public, well maintained, very well done, you know, the, the tours and such. The commissioner heads up a parks agency. Mass Department of Transportation is not a parks agency. So when Ron Killian comes before the Conservation Commission, get the approvals that he needs for what the, the Department of Transportation is responsible for. The bridges, the, the open space next to the bridges, the fact they have to cut down trees in order to maintain the bridges and such, and, and we the commission approve it. When we have a discussion about the open spaces, about tree removal, about how they mark the trees, how they replace the trees, it's a very different conversation. It is a totally different culture. And it's that's not their job. They're, they're not in the park's open space business. So I think to some extent, as I've been listening to these conversations that you have had, it is very different cultures. Now, let me tell you the exception to that rule. Massport, the Massachusetts Port Authority, which people say, gee, they run an airport, they run Conley Terminal, they run waterfront properties. They're not a parks agency. But I will tell you, every park maintained by Massport whether it's Piers Park, whether it's South Boston Maritime Park, whether it's Bremen Street Park, which was built by the Central Artery, now maintained by Mountsport, is an extraordinary park. They rival private sector parks. So one of the things I would also suggest, I'm putting this here, and the sec Secretary Davey not only is in charge of transportation, he also happens right now to chair Mountsport's board. I think that conversations about how you have and we want to use Commissioner Lambert's expertise. Um, you know, you have, you know, his agency. You have Massport, and you have Mass DOT. I think there needs to be within the state administration, maybe some type of task force or working together to look at how you can take advantage of the state expertise overall. Maybe someday Massport will be responsible for this part. Who knows? Maybe it's you know, maybe it's DCR. I mean, we don't know what five years will be like under a different. So what we're trying to do right now is to set up the mechanism so that this park will continue to flourish and be as beautiful and have the type of programming that it has today with the funding that's necessary. And so my only contribution to this discussion, sorry to be long-winded, is there are state agencies, not only Mass DOT, but taking advantage of the fact that the commissioner has come this evening and has consistently been involved himself in this. And I would also look at um, Massport as well, and maybe we can also figure out a way to also take advantage of that. And finally, as Clinton said, it is in the end. We must pressure the legislature, not only for your part, but to get the funding that we need so that your agency can do what it does. We have a short window now before we get next winter. We're going to have the conversation again, yet about more fair increases, service cuts, because they are trying to run an agency, and they are not getting the support they need from the legislature. So, as a citizen, I'm also reminding all of us that we really must continue to push the legislature, not only for your funding, but so that you can run your agency and do what you need to do. Thanks. Um. <laughs> Very good. Uh, may I just say that we do rely on Ed and Tony Pollock from the city um, for a lot of expertise, and it's wonderful that they both serve on the Green Leadership Council, so thank you. Yes. Hello, I'm Nathan Swain. I'm going to make a short announcement about a new group. Um, I'm president of a recently formed. Uh, I'm president of a recently formed organization called Friends of the North End Parks. We represent a growing group of North End waterfront residents, uh, businesses, and interests interested citizens who wish to bring parcels 8 and 10, the vision and promise followed by nearly two decades of the big day. These amenities were to beautify the parks and to make them pleasant and comfortable gathering places. We are committed to seeing this vision realized by moving from highway plantings to world-class gardens. Parcels 8 and 10 have not achieved the level of beauty and comfort residents were promised and desired, as reported in the Conservancy's recent survey. It continues to be an unfulfilled dream. Friends of the North End Parks look forward to collaborating with the board, the uh, leadership council, 
and the uh, Conservancy to transform these parks. We have met with the mayor, built a nonprofit organization, reached out to the community, and have engaged top horticulturalists. In July, the Perennial Plant Association and world-renowned horticulturalist Adrian Bloom toured the Greenway and expressed interest in working with the Friends Group. We have met with the Conservancy and will continue the discussions. We look forward to a transparent and inclusive endeavor to beautify these parks and create world-class gardens. The North End Parks will be a space rich in horticulture, beauty that reflects the seasons and landscape in the community. The world-class gardens will be sustainably designed and nature, nurtured through community engagement and by well-integrated planning with our many public, private, and non-profit colleagues. Friends of the North End Parks will convene individuals and organizations who are committed to supporting, improving, and caring for the park space for generations to come. Our next step is to build our membership. We have brochures and membership forms for all of you, and we welcome you to join. Thank you. If I could just say, we have had a, a good uh, kickoff meeting with the Friends of the North End Park about three weeks ago. I look forward to uh, knowing when the next one will be. One of the wonderful things about the Greenway is it really does take a village to run uh, this park, all of it, all mile and a half of it. And we really look forward to working uh, with groups that care about the Greenway as much as we do. It is a process. And one of the things that, that I think Nate is suggesting is that uh, groups that have not worked together in the past, we look at this opportunity to work together now to make the parks better. And all of us will bring our particular skill sets to this collaboration. The things that we're best at, we'll, uh, each of us can contributing what those things are to a, a comprehensive plan. It's a, it's a wonderful idea. And I think you know, volunteerism, I think volunteerism is all about generosity. <laughs> generosity of time, uh, generosity sometimes in uh, monetary terms, and generosity in terms of people that are putting down their self-interest and coming together for the good of the public and the public parks. So we look forward to the next meeting with them and it could be an inter interesting model, building on our volunteer model uh, as well. And we'll be talking, I think, more about this uh, at uh, upcoming meetings, yes, Nate? Yes. All right. Thank you. I want to, I want to, um, I, I, I'm going to ask that people limit their comments to a minute or two um, because we, we really do want to go at eight. I wonder if we could kind of come back to the business plan. And, and I'd love to get back to the business plan. Okay, I'll try to but balance out Vivian's five minutes. With <laughs> <laughs> okay, <laughs> go for it. from the aquarium. I had a little trouble with the logic. And Tom asked about the, uh, the bid area. And your findings seem to be showed clearly from the outside consultant that you hired that the private philanthropy was very much, the viability of private philanthropy was very much dependent on the constancy of state funding. I'm not sure that was the right word. But, and then somehow you've made this logistical twist where the state funding goes down, and private philanthropy goes up. And I break down on that logic. There. Well, that's, that's that that's school that I'm not building yet. Like the, the earned okay. income. Um, I mean, really, conceptually, what we're saying is that the state funding can really only go down if we can think of new ways for earned income. So without a, a consensus on guidelines can change, that then different things can happen, we probably can't achieve the 1.2 in the state. So it really is totally dependent on getting new sources of income. That right. And then I guess the, then sort of related to that, you know, thinking about corporate support, uh, you know, so I spent a lot of time raising money as well. If there's one thing that's clear from the recession, that is corporate philanthropy is over. And so if you want to go to corporations to raise money, 
it's got to be visibility because it's got to come from their marketing department. Exactly right. So you are exactly right. You're going to have to cross that line about naming opportunities and visibility. They want to know how many eyeballs their support is going to reach, and that's their money, and they're perfectly justified to do it. We're dealing with that same issue, as I'm sure other people who raise money is. So you're going to have to confront that front and center. And then the last thing I'd say is, without offending anybody on your board, I don't see too many multimillionaires. And if you're going to go private philanthropy, <laughs> you're probably going to have to have a very different board than what I hear the legislature trying to do and go the other direction. So. Sorry, I went beyond my half a minute. No. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you're welcome. Yeah, no, we, we, this people. whole plan is contingent <laughs> upon um, being able to produce it, and if the legislature will do what the legislature will do, but if they do what they might do, this plan will need to be revived. Yes, <clears throat> my name is Victor Branya, and I'm from the North End, and this does not uh, address the budget, but it does address a comment uh, that you made. I'm going to make a statement that probably doesn't need to be made, but I can't risk not making it, which is to address uh, your comment that young professionals want an 18-hour day. I can assure you that as for parcels 8 and 10, the North End parcels, the North End community does not want to see an 18-hour day. And please keep that in mind when you're programming. Thank you. Uh, yes, Peter. Sorry, there's a bug flying around. I'm not really waving off. My name is Peter Gorey. I'm a resident of Jamaica Plain. Island <laughs> citizen. Uh, but I just wanted to thank you. It's, it's going to be interesting for me on this side of the, most of you know me. I've worked around these parts for many a year. I'm also a board member. Some of you might not know. I'm a board member of the Esplanade Association. So the data that was provided to you is from our organization we're happy to do it and um, it's nice to have collaboration amongst all the open space uh, friends groups conservancies and the like um, this is an evolution I work closely with the conservancy members of the public and the, and the public agencies over a, a brief career in the public sector um, on this uh, part of town again and the evolution including things like uh, maintenance facility no longer being included capital reserves being dealt with or at least projecting out how to deal with those um, and some of the large scale um, programmatic needs that have evolved um, being plugged in and also, also looking at those as growth opportunities I think is wonderful. Um, the only thing you now wearing a private sector hat what I'm doing now which is in retail and restaurant brokerage I would caution you and I've said this before privately but I'll say it now publicly uh, to be very 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 careful what you project for restaurant and or food service in this park as Jesse and most of you know the the, the food trucks are themselves a, a an anomaly in, in their success I think in the volumes that they do but the earned income potential is is um, not that great and the capital investment needed to build facilities on this park as everyone knows with the years that it took to build it and design the Harbor Islands Pavilion and their meeting the Heritage Park is going to be an extremely large number that may not bear out as it does in Millennium Park and Bryant Park with full service, 360 day a year restaurants. So I caution you to be really careful about that. Other than that, I look forward to Thank you, Peter. We'll look forward to your words of wisdom. Does everybody notice how tan Peter is? It's so much more relaxed. It's just in no Okay, there's two more questions. I'll, I'll call on you both because you've had your hands up, but then, then we're done. Yes, sir. Uh, Dave Kubiak, North End resident, member of the North End Waterfront Residents Association, and proud member of a new organization called Friends of the North End Parks, which wants to bring better horticulture to the parcels 8 and 10, care for that horticulture, bring the North End community into those parks at no additional cost to the conservancy. That's the purpose, and that's how we fit into the operation planning that needs to take place. And I say needs to take place because I think what we're hearing tonight, at least what I'm hearing tonight, is that there is no feasible, um, final feasible plan for for funding the Greenway, operating the Greenway, and that there needs to be a plan. Yes, there is a plan. And what you're proposing. The plan, the plan we put up on the board. There is me, a plan. Let me, let and me I, comment, we, we, Nancy said it very you can, well. You we can look talk after I work. comment, please. So what I am recommending is that there be a much longer planning process 
to get to the point that there is a feasible plan for greenway operations that takes a look at things like what Vivian said about uh, who can bring the best, I take it as, who brings more to the conservancy than, say, MassDOT does. I think MassDOT is, is uncomfortable. And it's, it's not the right fit for a park. And the state, I think, needs to take a look at is there a better way of bringing its participation into the management of those state parks. And I would hope you'd also bring, uh, you'd also allow for much more public process to uh, recognizing the leadership council as representing the communities. I acknowledge that. I thank you for your representation. And it was mentioned that they have worked on this, this business plan. But the public, I think, is seeing this for the first time. Is tonight the beginning and the end of the public process? Maybe I certainly the hope not. It's the and beginning. I, and I hope that this planning process is going to continue for, a, for quite a long time and is going to involve the public and especially the communities along, along the Greenway. You mentioned, you used the term state park over and over again. And I think that's great that you're using that term. I'm really afraid, though, that some of what you're proposing to fund it is going to lead to privatization. And this is a state park, and it should be treated as such. And I'm afraid we'll go in the direction of, say, um, Rose War, for instance, where you can hardly, the public can hardly walk through there between the tables, the very costly tables where people would pay to be able to sit and enjoy dinner as they do there, as opposed to, say, Long Wharf, which is open and freely accessible even to the public that can't afford to, uh, a table or can't afford uh, an expensive ride on a carousel or any of the other kinds of things that might bring in income. We need to be very careful about not shutting out this is an economic justice issue, not shutting out parts of the population through these in current income plans. But I look forward, I hope that there is going to be a much longer process, a public process leading to a very good operation plan for the Green Bay. Thank you. Um, I'm not sure if you were here in the beginning, um, so let me just end, and I'm afraid I am going to have to end. We're just, I'm sorry, but we're just, you know, Okay, if you promise you'll keep to a minute. Um, I, I mean, I'd love to hear comments, okay. but I, I do want to make sure people can leave. I will be very quick. Um, my name is Christine Glynn. Um, I've lived in Boston and worked within the city um, for the last 20 years. I'm also on the board uh, with Pete. Um, I just want to say I support what you're doing. Um, I think it's absolutely fantastic. I was just there today. Every time my niece comes into the city, she wants to go to the little squirty fountain is what she calls it. Um, so, and, and there's something new there every single time I come in. So I'm just very impressed. Thank you, Christine. I appreciate that. Will these slides be available? Yes, they will be on our website tomorrow. Um, so, the, um, but that, that's a good lead in all the way through to just, just coming back to where I started, that, that we will deliver a plan to um, Secretary Davey by July 31st. But it will, we want you all to consider it will be the start of the real discussion. It will be that this is a, a place to say, the board thinks we can probably do this. But it doesn't mean that that's the right thing that is where it's going to end up. We need to get the state involved. We need to get the public involved. We need to get the bid folks involved. We need to get philanthropy involved. We need to make these parks continue to be supported in a way that, that they can grow and be fabulous. So we will do that, and it will be the start, and there will be many times for your input in the future. Thank you. All right, so it's summer. It is summer on in the parks. And for five minutes or so, <coughs> I'm going to just walk you through some of the exciting things that please, be, um, please come and enjoy. So, all right. We will announce tomorrow a uh, collaboration with the Institute of Contemporary Art in which two very exciting artists will uh, begin to paint a mural on the air intake structure with our collaborators at MassDOT and the support of the city's art commission. 
the artists are Osemios. Uh, Osemios is uh, Portuguese for twins because these two extraordinary people, uh, Gustavo and Octavio, excuse me, Octavio Pandolfo, will be uh, doing an exhibit at the ICA and taking their art into the uh, public for free in this extraordinary mural. It will take them roughly 10 days to execute the mural and it will open to the public whether, you know, up, please. Oh, by the way, it's Rose Kennedy's birthday we anniversary week, so uh, if Rose is listening, we can use some good weather while they're painting. <laughs> Next, please. We also, as part of our commitment to uh, wonderful free activation on the Greenway, have been, as Jesse mentioned, actively involved in a five-year public art planning process. And I just want to ask you to put October 2nd on your calendars when we will roll out that plan uh, and at a public meeting. Next, please. Uh, we were talking uh, uh, about uh, trash. We were talking trash. <laughs> and uh, we, I wanted to make sure you knew that we have a new <laughs> a new cycling, recycling program starting. That is probably, in the eyes of some supporters like Peter, only the, the next step in how to, uh, to think about uh, how we handle trash and how we do so with increasing uh, environmental stewardship as the way we go about it. Uh, but this is a very nice next step. It is a pilot that we're going to undertake, but we expect it's going to be very successful and off we go. We, uh, we go now to uh, uh, the sky and you can watch more bird life coming back to the Greenway. The more horticulture thrives, the more the environment is very welcoming to birds. And the Carolina Wren has been a uh, has been missing in action uh, in downtown Boston for a while. And working with our friends at North Bennett Street School, we have done, uh, per the specifications of the Appalachian Mountain Club, uh, a really wonderful collaboration on bringing birds uh, their own special dwellings. And we have lots coming up. Uh, we have this uh, in the last couple of weeks and continuing on on Friday nights from 6 to 8, the Berkeley Concert Series. And the concerts are taking, uh, taking place on Milk and India Street. We, if you'll just leave that up, Jesse. Uh, we will also, uh, starting tomorrow, have a <laughs> pop-up refrigerator museum uh, that uh, takes our environmental stewardship one more step into public education and working with partners that will be uh, at showing vintage refrigerators and freezers and how uh, to recycle them and get rebates on new equipment. <laughs> so be there tomorrow on Dewey. <laughs> also tomorrow at the Rings Mountain. Bon Me will be partnering with East by Northeast in Cambridge to do a pop-up restaurant at 5 to 9 p.m. with a fixed price dinner. What fun. And this weekend, there is, there's hardly a square inch of uh, Boston that isn't filled with art and music. And uh, in the Greenway on Saturday from 11 to 11, on the southern end of the Greenway, Figment, this wonderful group of 60 artists and growing, will offer a free arts experience on the Greenway, and that will be carried over into Sunday from noon to 6. So don't leave town. Come to the Greenway. All right. Georgia, would you like to wrap it up? Um, hey, we did it. Um, it's about two minutes of eight. Um, and um, one of our commitments uh, that we all live by in the board and stuff is, you know, we start meetings on time and we end them on time. So um, I appreciate you coming out. Um, this information will be available on our website. Um, I think you all know where to find us. Um, be in touch. And uh, we'll, um, we'll 
when we when we have the final plan and all the draft, um, right now everything's in draft of the Collins report, the TPC report, and the survey. Um, they will all be done um, by July 31st. We will deliver the plan to the secretary by then, and it will go up on our website. So you, you will be able to get it all together by July 31st. And tune into And tune into Chronicle. Oh, that's what you were telling me. I'm sorry. I couldn't read your lips. Um, and and uh, Lisa's reminding me that you should all tune into Chronicle tomorrow and see the green So it's a program on the carousel. Uh, the, New iconic carousel for Boston. And Chronicle is 7 o'clock? 7.30. 7 7.30. 7 Channel 5. Channel 5. Okay. Thank you all. Thank you.